Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We ask capture leaders about their projects, learn what they said, and what this means for you. I'm Teresa Resick, Director in the Market Intelligence Group here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are AIM's Chief Analyst, Bob Larrabee, and we also have Greg Council from Periscript and Mark Pickard from Epson. And Periscript and Epson are the underwriters of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And as we get started here, just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. And across the bottom of your screen is a list of all the widgets that are available to you. And one of those widgets is group chat, and it, that you will need to open up. It's not already open on your desktop. And you just click on that group chat icon, and you'll be able to uh, text uh, chat with each other and also with a few of us here at AIM. Do ask questions throughout our webinar time using the Q&A feature. And we will hold them until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right of the slide area. There's also a couple of other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. So just click in there at any time, and that resource will open in a new browser tab, and you can save that and read it after the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser, and it's also in the, the widgets below the slide area. And I would greatly appreciate it if you would take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. And very pleased to introduce the speakers we have with us today. Bob Larrabee is, the, is Vice President and Chief Analyst of Market Intelligence here at AIM. And Bob is an expert in the application of advanced technologies and process improvement to solve business problems and enhancing business operations. With over 30 years of industry experience, including product management, R&D, marketing, sales, and education, his passion is to share his knowledge and experience with organizations seeking to improve their operations, embrace technology, and drive their business forward. Greg Council is Vice President at Periscript. Greg specializes in revitalizing existing products and bringing new products to market in the document capture, enterprise content management, and business process management markets. He has over 15 years experience in requirements gathering, product planning, competitive market analysis, product marketing and channel engagement for both on-prem and SaaS software solutions. And then we also have Mark Pickard, and he is the Senior Product Manager for Scanners at Epson. And, and it's a position which he has held for eight years. He covers scanners used in document management, as well as those used in professional photography. And he's based in Epson's U.S. headquarters in Long Beach, California. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Bob Larvey to begin our discussion today. Bob? Uh, thank you, Teresa. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, thank you also, Greg and Mark, uh, for participating in, in underwriting this. Without you guys, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. And welcome everybody that's joining us from uh, around the globe today. Um, we got some really exciting news to share with you and some insights based on some research that we had done together. Um, what I'd like to do is set the tone for the session um, and, and present to you some other statistics that kind of wrap around all this. Uh, this comes from our State of the Intelligent Information Management Industry Watch. And, and one of the things that you know, we find is that businesses really must adapt today. Um, there is a potential for disruption. This is a huge reality. And disruption could come in many different forms. And we can't really do business as usual the way that we once did. Um, so when you look at the impact of rac rapid technology change on core business models, better than 50%, better than half, 53% of the organizations that we talked with feel that they're living on the edge uh, regarding a serious potential um, disruption in their business models. And when we talk about the disruption, like I said, it's not just technology. It could be pretty much anything. It could be the business landscape. It could be regulatory compliance, things along those lines that are going to dis disrupt the current model that we have. And digital disruption really is more than just technology. Um, it's creating a new business model, a new way of working within the organization. And so 
The other thing that we found is businesses really do recognize the need to do this, and digital transformation has become that focus for the business leaders. Uh, they really are embracing this, this concept of digital transformation, and when we talk about digital transformation, it's not just capturing uh, paper anymore, it's digital, really digital processing. Um, things like uh, automated uh, data extraction, uh, really trying to streamline the processes by using the technology and leveraging the technology. And 81% of the organizations that we talked with believe that digital transformation is either important or very important to their organizations. So they see this as something essential going forward um, as a future endeavor. And what, this brings us to what we refer to as the digital transformation journey, which you may have heard uh, in the past, and certainly from AIM. And the underpinnings of this are what we refer to as Intelligent Information Management, or IIM, and this really is the key to success. So there are four um, intelligent information practices or methodologies that we looked at in relation to uh, IIM, and they are critical to dig digital transformation. And this means modernizing your information toolkit, so upgrading the tools that you use so that we can enhance and expand our information ecosystem. Digitalizing the core organizational processes, so your business processes, the way that you transact business and interact with each other and with information, but also the customer experience on the end of this, um, really giving them an enhanced and improved uh, customer experience because if they don't have a good experience, they're going to leave. And so we want to make sure that we retain them. Automating compliance and governance as much as we possibly can, and these days governance is becoming a huge thing in, in compliance. Uh, regulatory issues that we need to face. And the one that's looming this week, as a matter of fact, is GDPR in the European Union, um, where that will take hold, but it really does affect a global audience, not just the European audience. And then finally, leveraging analytics and machine learning um, to be able to help us with this automated decision-making capabilities. You know, sometimes we have these uh, transactional processes that uh, we have individuals that are running these things or people involved in these when really we could turn that into something much more automated and based on a set of criteria have the systems make those determinations for us. And so we did ask about the digital transformation journey and how well organizations are going. You know, what is the goal? Um, and uh, what we found was the distance, and there's still a long way to go for a lot of organizations. Uh, with only 22 months from 2020, and that was the target or the stake that we threw in the ground, we found that less than one in five organizations are near where they want to be uh, for their core transformation challenges of understanding, anticipating, and redefining internal and external customer experiences. So there's a long way to go here um, in relation to the digital transformation journey for a lot of business organizations. They're on their way, um, and they are taking steps to get there, but uh, we still quite a bit to do in order to get there. Now, one of the things that we also look at is the beginning of the process, right, uh, in business processes. And really, information capture is key. And in particular, capture at first touch point uh, becomes much more vital in the automated environment. What we want to do is get that information, capture it, um, get it under our control, right? We want it secure, but we also want it to be able to work for us. So not only do we secure the information at the point of first, uh, first touch, but this can also launch our workflows based on the type of information that it is. And so once we capture this information, maybe it's a field representative or somebody along those lines, um, we capture it, we secure it, we manage it properly, but we also start launching workflows and we inject this into our business processes, which leads us to enabling better management um, across the organization. So getting back to those four pillars or those four underpinnings of, of uh, the digital transformation journey in IIM, modernizing that information toolkit, digitalizing the uh, processes, automating compliance, and leveraging our analytics and machine learning capabilities really does bring much more intelligence to the way we do things today. So intelligent information management and, and helping us streamline and automate all of these processes. And so what I'm going to do right now, because one of the things that we do like to do at AIM um, is to take some surveys, I'm going to take a quick poll with you 
um, ask you a quick question, and then uh, we'll work with Teresa and move on to uh, Greg, who's going to start sharing with us some of the statistics and findings that we had in our uh, joint efforts in, in, uh, in this particular, uh, focused on this particular session. So the question that I'm going to ask you right now, which document type do you classify or extract data from the most by volume? Is it electronic documents, PDF, Microsoft Office, or emails of some type? Is it scanned documents, so uh, TIFF or image-based PDFs, or are you using paper forms? So if you take a moment and just kind of answer this, hit the submit button, and then we'll took it, take a look at the results before we turn things over to Greg. I know, Bob, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, you know, we do all of these things. And, uh, and, and as much as, um, you know, ranking them in importance, but uh, we're also just looking to see what, you know, what's, what's the one type of document, what is the, the greatest document type that, that you do the most work in. And um, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and take a look at those results right now. And uh, uh, Greg Council from Periscript, want to invite you in. And uh, are, th are these the typical types of responses that you were seeing that people um, are working the most with the electronic and scanned documents, and less so with paper forms? Well, you know, off the off the off the top, um, intuitively, you would expect more um, activities and things to be done with electronic documents, um, since you know, as, in terms of uh, overall volume share, relatively speaking, electronic documents vast outnumber uh, scan documents or paper forms. But what this, what this seems to indicate is that there's really a, a view from a process-centric type of perspective for documents. So you know, if I were to look at this from a different lens and, and look at whether, you know, whether it's a loan origination type of process or some type of accounts automation type of process, yeah, I think that then they start to, it starts to make more sense that they're almost I mean, they are equal, in, at least in this in this poll, uh, as opposed to the paper form. So it, it does. It, it, as soon as you start to peel back the layers of the onion, it starts to make sense from a process perspective. Well, go ahead and continue from here, Greg. All right then. Well, hello everyone. Um, as I was introduced in the very beginning, even though there's a marketing uh, word in there, I'm really a, a product guy, a solutions guy. So I like data. I like getting and uncovering the facts and the, the sources of pain, and that's really what appeals to me. Um, so we went and uh, we, we typically will partner with, with AIM to uh, create research that we think that, that is useful for us to better understand your problems, but also to, to kind of provide a reflection back and let you understand yourself. So the objective really is to get a better or just a continued uh, understanding of the technologies and the uh, approaches to adoption of those technologies, uh, specifically around document-based automation. So, uh, you know, in this case, the survey did a really good job at providing an overall coverage uh, for not only uh, smaller organizations but also larger ones. And then, from an audience standpoint, we're really focused on the operations side of things. Those people that touch the systems or are key stakeholders in those types of systems. So that's really the objective here. And digging into a little bit more about who we surveyed, you know, it's no surprise that it's going to be a heavy weight on U.S.-based respondents, but it's really nice to see that a good swath of other geographies are represented in there. From an organizational size, again, this, I think, it really starts to look uh, like a typical distribution of organizations, especially when you're looking at uh, there's a good uh, large uh, majority uh, within the less than 100 to 100 to 500, so that kind of small to mid-sized type of enterprise. So I, ultimately, I think the representation here is, is very well done. So let's dig into some of the details and the, and the data within and behind it. Now, before I start, uh, some of these slides, up, I'm just going to go ahead and say, are a little bit, it, it's more difficult to uh, interpret the information because it can be complex. Some of these uh, result on uh, multiple different kinds of, of kinds of questions. So I wanted to provide a little bit of background on how to use this using the top row. So for the top row, what this suggests is, is between 81 to 100% of respondents 
state that paper and scan documents represent 89% of their overall volume, whereas 9% uh, are digitally born and 2% are e -forms. So you can look at that on the way down. Now, from a high level, should it be any surprise that paper and scan documents, for the good point, you know, they're either an overwhelming percentage of document volume or going further down in the middle, it's, you know, roughly just over the majority or just over 50%. Our paper and scan documents. So that, that continues to track and, and make sense, especially as, as we encounter the experience that, that my company has. What's really interesting is when you cast this against the information that we gathered in our survey last year, which tended to have the, the paper and scan documents were a little bit, bit more muted in comparison to other document forms. So we're taking this and looking at it as an overall pie. And what this represents, at least how I interpret it, is is more and more of these paper documents are getting infused into this a digitization type of process which which increases the overall number. So I think that's a very good that's a very positive trend, especially as we're talking about digital transformation where if you're looking at this as a capability uh, you know maturity type of situation, the first level of, of that need is the ability to get data into a format that can be easily shared and easily processed. So going into the next slide, um, we did this one as well. This was a continuation of the survey from last year. There's still a significant number of respondents um, that reported they processed more than 10 document types. And again, this suggests that more document-based processes are adopting document automation. So as companies get more familiar with document automation, they're looking around and saying, okay, how can we get rid of more paper and inject a, you know, faster turnaround times or improved user experience or customer experience into that? The number of respondents with the 6 to 10 was slightly lower than last year, so it was down from 16%, while those reporting 3 to 5 document types increased uh, to 21%. So these variances aren't really, I don't, I don't consider them that significant. But if anything, shows that document automation is a, in a steady state of use and increasing footprint within organizations. Okay, this was a new question. So the biggest document processing challenges, because as when we encounter and we uh, work with clients, uh, it, it's often not the technology itself, but the organizational preparedness and readiness and all these other types of things that are, I would say, not hard issues, but more of the soft type of political environment, if you will. So even though document automation, such as classification and, and use of OCR to extract transactional information or forms has been around for years, the adoption of it still lags behind the need, you know, either from the ability to increase use within an organization where it already exists or to adopt it in the first place. So for this question, we let the respondents express, you know, in their own words, the challenges that you see here. And this is a summary of the most frequent responses. So I don't think that the organizational time resource problems should surprise anyone as they plague every organization. If you're in a small company, you're always going to be uh, challenged with staff. But even in large organizations, it's often a shock for new people there's still those types of staff uh, constraints because they're trying to take on a, a number of different projects. But the technical limitations identified are interesting given the relative maturity of document automation technologies. For example, environmental responses, that was, that's the bottom left, point to the always changing nature, nature of businesses and the inability for organizations to keep up. So you know, things move at a faster pace. and the ability to adjust and adapt existing technologies either to the same business processes or to new, new ones is, is really hard. Um, on, the, on the technical side, integration complexity and limitations of the technology uh, to easily adapt to change requirements, that seems to point that there is still a way to go before automation can be applied more broadly. So uh, it may be a, a, the way that it's a best of breed type of approach or a purchase of a single vendor that leads to some of these limitations. But we're going to dig into that in the, in the next slide. Okay. Now these two are also new questions aimed at understanding the nature of operations. 
The first deals on the left with the number of separate installations of document capture from the same vendor. So I went digging into the data, into the details of the responses, and found that, interestingly enough, there isn't a strong correlation between company size and the presence of more than one installation. You would normally think that the larger an organization has, the more installations they would have for different departments or organizations. Uh, so it suggests that large or small, document automation installations are more likely to be driven by department or functional needs. So an accounting system in a horizontal type of perspective uh, is going to use different technology than maybe some other type of process. Now, there is a stronger correlation between the number of systems and organization size with the large organizations having four or more installations and small organizations typically having a lower number, but that shouldn't be surprising. On the second one on the right, um, it was targeted at understanding the number of vendors supplying automation within a given environment, largely because procurement is becoming centralized, and so there's this natural tendency to want to pick uh, uh, sole source types of solutions for that. The most common rationale is that when you have one vendor, there's alignment in capabilities for a specific need. There's the data that, but the data suggests that the best of breed approach is almost equal to selecting a single vendor for all needs. So it's um, it, it, it really isn't showing a trend to specifically consolidate on one vendor or to continue to do that best of breed. So there's no clear correlation between that. Now, efficiencies can clearly be gained through consolidation of installations, and vendors provide some you know, simplification of overall cost savings. I think that that's something that we're seeing uh, more organizations want to pursue, but it's those challenges that we've already covered that keep them from doing that. Okay, so next is all about eForms technology adoption. It can, Clearly, it continues to make gains into business processes, you know, and for good reason. With more modular, you know, with more mobile computers out there, it really makes sense to capture data in a, in a clear format, you know, something that doesn't require running OCR, something that doesn't require paper handling and things like that. You know, and it not only is it cleaner, but it's in a, it, it happens in a quicker manner. So it obviates a lot of the delays and costs associated with conversion of handwritten entries and, and uh, into machine-readable data. Um, you know, with the growing adoption of robotic process automation, there's another three-letter letter abbreviation that I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard about and are, are digging into. If not, you're already fully embroiled with those projects. It shouldn't be a surprise that simpler workflows, such as account opening or customer onboarding or adopting eForms, to make data readily accessible and, and earlier in that process. On the other side of things, if you look at the differences between uh, eForms technology and more complex types of processes, such as, as loan origination or, or mortgage origination, there is less, less use of those eForms. So the next set of questions are going to dig a little deeper into these challenges. So I, I find this pretty interesting. All right. So this slide has, a, again, some two pieces of information right and left. So last year we asked how many organizations can process digital documents and data in the same system that handles scan documents. And the reason why we asked that question is because the more you can streamline uh, the same data, so the, the more you can disregard the type of format the data is in and treat it all equally, uh, the, the simpler work processes are, the more transparent they are, uh, the more seamless they appear to be from a customer experience perspective. So last year the results were a little bit higher than when we constrained the question to eForms only, right? So this year we're looking at it from eForms and paper forms, not just electronic information and, and paper-based information. You can see here clearly uh, less than half don't have those systems, and so it, this is an area where, where we can improve that capability maturity model to be able to move to the next level of digital transformation. That's one area of improvement that, that is out there to, uh, to be had. The second question gets at the level of paper involved in a business process versus paperless data, okay? 
So not surprisingly, loan, you know, here's where we get really get into the, the details. Loan processing and mortgage origination are two of the lowest in terms of dealing with, with paperless processes. Realistically, we believe the inability to streamline forms processing in a single system, along with the amount of documents involved, are two obstacles to e-forms recognition there. So one of the, the, the logical conclusions here is the simpler the processes, the more readily they'll be able to adopt uh, e-forms technology, if not in a hybrid approach, uh, a completely e-forms e based type of uh, process initiation. Okay, so we've got a number of different types of data points that we want to cover in this slide. These are also questions, more or less, that we kept from last year as well to, to be able to anticipate trends. So basically what we're interested in here is the ability for organizations to consolidate their document processing regards the format. So the previous slide talked about e-forms versus paper forms. Now we're talking about all sorts of information. Last year, 22% of respondents reported that they had successfully implemented a system that can handle both native digital and scan documents in the same system. And the workflow, and that there isn't much change in this year, even though half of the respondents think it would be valuable. So we've clearly got a somewhat of a dichotomy to where the, the interest and the desire to be able to do it is, is much greater than the actual ability to do that for all of the reasons that we talked about previously. So we suspect that way in the in the in document automation is adopted along with the way that you know identified challenges that we covered in the previous slide really present substantial obstacles to the ability to streamline automation technology and processes. But there's a bit of good news because with any type of technology, there's always a horizon for refreshing the technology. So what we see a lot of clients doing is when they're going to that next level and they're looking to, they're transitioning, they're, maybe they're moving to new hardware, maybe they're moving to virtualized environments or cloud environments, they're looking at ways to replace their existing technology with something that's more expansive that can provide that almost out-of-the-box capability to streamline um, work processes, document-based, uh, document-oriented processes for practically any type of data format. Okay, now, now we get into the really cool machine learning stuff. Uh, I think that everybody is, is uh, probably sick of AI this and AI that, Alexa, Cortana, Siri. Um, now Google has this new duplex type of assistant that can make phone calls apparently for you. I just want to let you know that I am not a chatbot. I am a real human being, although that I can see a future where webinars like these will be live, but there will be chatbots talking to each other. So last year we asked about opinions on, on system ease of use. And ease of use is really important for all the reasons around technology adoption. The easier it is to install, the easier it is to configure and, and operate, the, the more chances you're going to have the ability to adopt in the first place, let alone project success. So you have 62% reported last year that document automation systems were very or somewhat difficult to configure, and I think that's a big problem. This response is echoed with the environmental and technical challenges we've already reviewed in, in the previous slides, we also asked about the relative importance of the ability to use machine learning to automate configuration of document types and data extraction, with this capability being the most in demand. So again, there's a great desire to have uh, machine learning or self-configuring systems in there, but not a whole lot of success or, or familiarity uh, with it. But a lot can change in a year. And this year, with, with all that attention on AI, we decided to ask specific respondents that have experience with, with systems that, that include machine learning um, what their perspectives were. So most are pretty satisfied. That's a good thing. Uh, oftentimes, early adoption of technologies yields to the uh, dreaded Gartner trough of disillusionment. Uh, that means that people try something, it doesn't work, and they put it on the shelf and, and don't go back, and that's a really bad thing. So most are pretty satisfied. And it appears that satisfaction 
is traced to the overall simplification of operations. So the more that those, you know, we're not looking at the application of machine learning just because machine learning is the next thing, but we're looking for it to solve practical problems. And those practical problems being with, with the upfront configuration or, or, or the overall operation of the system to be able to um, improve things. So going back to the challenges often encountered with document automation, remember that the ability to adapt to changing requirements was a popular response. So machine learning offers the promise of automating tasks associated with initial and ongoing configuration. And more advanced machine learning technologies can even help to adapt to changing scenarios. So that's something that clearly document automation is doing, robotic process automation is doing, and generally something that can, can, that can heal itself is what we're all after, right? So it's good to know that the, the respondents overall, their perceptions were pretty positive. So we'll see, a, I'm sure we'll see a lot more of that in the, in the coming 12 months, if not the next six months. Okay, so the last one, and then I'll transition over to the next poll, uh, is the direction and the future of, of where automation is really going to occur. And I don't think this should come as a surprise to anybody on, on this uh, webinar. So we asked about future plans given that today's processes, regardless of indus industry, are undergoing a massive shift to you know more customer-centric, digital, mobile uh, types of processes. Expanding automation to digitally born documents also shouldn't be a surprise. It's the major focus followed by increased use of e-forms. So this goes back to that capability maturity model, if you will, or, or like the AIM framework, which I think is a great framework because it's very practical. You can tackle it in different chunks. First, get the data in a format that is easily shareable, easily, easily consumable, and enables your process to become more transparent. So we suspect that these two initiatives really are around uh, you know, competing, really, with expanding existing document automation to, do, to new document types, new kind of scanned document types. Since increasing, increasingly scanned documents are being replaced by their digital alternatives anyway, right? So if we're moving to e-forms, that in, a, in a many ways can obviate the need to have uh, paper forms or, or digital forms, uh, you know, paper forms that are scanned into digital forms and certainly the paper itself. Um, we always wonder, though, about adoption of cloud-based systems, and it appears that this, this process is really still limited, possibly due to the sensitive nature of data within many document-oriented processes, think mortgages or health and all those types of things. It's a really hard challenge to uh, be able to take that off into the cloud without concern over uh, security risk. And things like GDPR are only going to make that more prevalent. But overall, this shows that there's an increased focus on digitally born documents, which I think is a very good thing overall to digital transformation. So with that, that is the last slide on my piece. So I think we go over to the poll. Yes, we do. Which is the percentage um, of electronic documents. But Teresa, are you going to take this one? Oh, sure. Um, you're welcome to stick around here to, to still chat about it. I will. It. Uh, because we want to know what percentage of electronic documents can be processed natively by your document capture system that you have in-house right now. Under 10 percent, um, between that 11 to 25 percent, 26 to 50 percent, that 51 to 75 percent, or 76 percent or more. Just looking to get a, a you know pulse point check from you in the audience, so come back to your keyboards and just let us know what percentage of, of electronic documents in your document capture system can be processed natively. Um, and so just looking to get a, a baseline for that because this is going to lead us into the next part of our conversation here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the results. And. Um, Looks like the, the greatest portion of respondents is seeing like that between the, the 26 to 50 percent of respondents um, had this highest number, and it's pretty much scattered across the board here. And uh, Mark Picker, our next speaker, is coming up here with us, and just wanted to know if if this is the kind of, of information that that uh, you know the results that you typically see as well. 
Well, it's encouraging to me when you combine this with the uh, earlier poll information that showed the, uh, the the majority of the information was still coming in on paper. And so it means we have there, there's a tremendous growth potential because obviously the software can help manage the electronic documents and then the hardware that we provide can help with the efficiency of the scanning process. So it uh, it shows great opportunity. I think the interesting oh, um, thing here too, Mark, is the word mm -hmm. can. <laughs> yes, yes. What, what percentage can be processed as opposed to are being processed? A very important That's point. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, Mark, go ahead and continue with your 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 part of the discussion here. Okay, and thank you very much for for having me along on this. This has been a particularly interesting. Uh, set of, of responses, and so I'll, I'll jump into those that uh, uh, that most matter to me in my business. Um, as you probably are aware, Epson is a provider of document scanners, among many other pieces of equipment. You're probably very familiar with our projectors and our inkjet printers as well, uh, and we have a, a, a wide range of, of other technologies that we are a part of. But in the scanner side, that is most interesting here, uh, this was our first question, which describes your uh, scanner deployment. And what I was looking for is whether or not uh, they were centralized versus distributed around an office. And I was actually kind of surprised that it was still this high. Uh, if you look at the, the two biggest columns, the brightest columns on the right, it shows that 60% of the scanners are centralized, whether it's the multifunction printers that are centrally located or a small number of high-performance scanners that are in, uh, in a central location. And that suggests a couple of things. Uh, one is that the paper may be uh, scanned at a central location before it makes it into the organization. So I, I was part of a study where we looked at some of the major financial institutions in New York, and they were scanning literally every piece of paper that came in the building because they didn't know what next year's regulations were going to require them to maintain. So everything got scanned, and so there was no need to deploy scanners around an office because uh, it was just done in the mailroom. Um, so that's one possibility. But the second possibility is the scanning load is distributed, but the scanners are not. So the worker must leave their workstation to go somewhere else to, to put those papers into scan, or even worse, send those materials through some intra-office uh, delivery and that is just an extremely inefficient way to capture the information. Um, just by the, uh, it's, it's two faceted. One is the time it takes to do that. One, to leave your workstation, go somewhere else, do the scanning. Hopefully no one is in line ahead of you. And then return to your workspace. But then there is the inefficiency that this causes. Uh, I read a University of California study not long ago that showed that on average it takes 21 minutes to return to full productivity after you've been interrupted. That, that's, uh, that study was titled, The Cost of Interrupted Work, More Speed and Less Stress. So it actually kind of surprisingly did not reduce the amount of work that they did, but it meant that the work was done faster, and that suggested a reduction in the quality of the work that these workers were doing. So uh, that's what I found most interesting from, from this particular survey result uh, was that only 40% uh, are, are using scanners that are uh, at or adjacent to their workspace. So I wanted to drill into that a little bit. And uh, this I also found interesting. Obviously, that's why we're including it. Um, but that's where they're getting the, the scanning hardware. And so the vast majority here, over 60%, was from a value-added reseller or systems integrator. That shows that this group uh, surveyed by AIM is a very different group than the broad market. The reason I say that is because uh, we, of course, consume a tremendous amount of industry data on where people are buying, what they're buying. And fully half of all scanners uh, purchased come through retail and online. And you can see those are the smallest two shares here. So uh, that means a couple of things. One, that this group is different. Second, that this is a group I want to be talking to. Um, uh, 
And a part of that goes to that last slide about uh, using centralized equipment. And, and I'll tie this together after we look at the, the next uh, little graph here that shows where they're getting the advice on selecting the hardware. And so the biggest chunk is the internal IT staff. They're, of course, closest to the environment, and so they would know the most about it. But my question is whether they are interested in finding the most efficient architecture for capturing information, or uh, could they be influenced by keeping the number of supported devices low? And um, there, are, there are other categories as well. Uh, the only 21% are taking the advice from their software vendor that might know a lot about the uh, the, the most efficient way to capture the information within that environment. And then the hardware reseller, do they know the, uh, the flow of information uh, that uh, is uh, governing the efficiency of the operation? So my takeaways from this uh, are here. With 60% of the scanners being away from uh, a workstation, uh, there's an opportunity to reconsider the efficient workflows. So uh, you want to ensure that the, that the interruptions to do the scanning are eliminated. It also suggests that uh, we need to examine the, the guidance from the IT department. Uh, not that it's necessarily wrong. I don't want to imply that. But just be sure they're including all the costs in making the decision, and not just the uh, the hardware cost. Uh, the centralized uh, scanners are very, very expensive, uh, but in some cases they're exactly the best thing for that environment. Uh, but make sure the efficiency of the workers is considered. It's very easy to look at a workflow, determine how much time is being wasted, and figure out that the small and expensive scanners widely deployed could literally pay them for themselves very, very quickly. And so we need to look at what is driving uh, the recommendation. And of course, why are we uh, Epson advocating the distributed scanners is because, of course, that's what we make available. Uh, Epson has the broadest range of desktop scanners in the industry. And the, the idea is to allow you to make exactly the right choice for each one of the workstations to make the deployment as efficient as possible with the lowest possible cost. And that's what we wanted to inject into this uh, discussion. So here's my contact information if there are any questions uh, around this or you want to uh, challenge any of my assumptions, that's always welcome. And so this is how I can be found. And back to you, Thanks, Teresa. Mark. Mm -hmm. And we did have one more poll question that we wanted to ask of everyone. And so come back to your keyboards one more time. And we're just looking to get a sense, um, does your capture system have machine learning capabilities and do you use it? And so there's just a variety of answers here. Um, yes, we have machine learning, but you don't use it. Um, yes, we have machine learning, use it, and it works well. Um, yes, we have it, you use it, but it doesn't quite meet your needs. Yes, you use it, but it doesn't, um, but it doesn't meet the needs at all. And no, you, you, your scanners do not, or your systems do not have the machine learning built into that. So just go ahead and take a moment and um, select the answer in here. Um, just if your, your capture system has those machine learning capabilities and uh, whether you use it and how it's working out for you. So we just wanted to get an understanding of, of where you are with that. And uh, just going to take a quick look at the uh, results here with this as well. And I invite um, Greg Council to come back in here. And, and looks like a lot of our audience that their capture systems have machine learning, but they're not using it or it's not meeting the needs, that that's uh, a little bit of that dotted around, but about 60% say that their uh, capture systems do not contain machine learning capabilities. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, it, it, the answer to this question, I don't think there's enough actual implementations that use machine learning with document automation to actually make it statistically significant, so we're going to see this skew every time we do this uh, research. Positive thing is I think that we've got uh, you know, 17, almost 18% that are using it, they say it works well, which is the, 
the, the second highest result, uh, you know, over the other options. Generally, um, I, I think there's there's general there's some concern over the black box focus uh, of, of, of many implementations where you implement it and you don't really have control over it. So I think that there's there's a little bit of concern over the, the visibility and the, the overall control over these kinds of capabilities. The second one I think out, outside the ones the ones that actually use it is you know, of course they their software may not have it, but the other piece of it is it it just may represent kind of a a a level of, of sophistication that, that makes it a little bit too complex and therefore it's not being used because they don't know how, it, it's really hard to configure it or, or put it into place or it's hard to manage it due to just time and lack of staff. Well, Greg, just want to give you an opportunity just to talk a little bit about um, what Periscript is about and uh, so let me just go ahead and let you uh, speak briefly to this slide here. Yeah, I, and, and I'm not going to read through this, but really the, the gist that I want to get here is that we're really interested in providing solutions that are easy to use and that can help you streamline this process of, of moving towards a, the, your digital transformation. So that kind of the underlying or underpinning capability of moving data that is you know, more difficult to use into a more useful format is really what we're all about. And building on over now over 30 years of of actual machine learning and artificial intelligence types of te technologies, the, the solutions that we bring to bear are really focused on that ease of use capability. So that, that's what I wanted to express on this one. Well, just to remind the audience, you, when you download a copy of the slides, you can get the contact information for both Greg and Mark and be able to reach out to them with a, directly any additional questions that you have. I know we're running a little bit long today, and so I want to just come back to Bob Larravee, because I know you've been sitting here listening to um, uh, what your colleagues have had to say, and just want you to um, summarize it all with some things to consider here. Well, thank you, Teresa, and, and thank you both, Greg and Mark. Um, this has been a great session. I really enjoyed working with you on this project and, and getting all this information. And, and some of the things that we saw in the live polls really do resonate to what we've been saying. And so things that I think people should consider or folks that are listening should consider, um, identify what you have both in paper and digital form. Um, know where it, where it lives. I mean, you have to know and understand what it is that you have before you can actually deal with it, and then document the processes that go along with this. Um, this is one area that I think a lot of businesses are really weak in. They don't truly understand what their business processes are and also how the information interacts with those processes. You know, what, what are the intersections? And look for opportunities to modify your workflows, like Greg was just talking about. Look for an opportunity in particular with capture to be able to get that information at first touch point if possible or as close as you possibly can get and convert you know all your all of your paper um, content into a digital form now i know you know i'm saying convert it all and i know that that may not be realistic for some organizations but um, those things that uh, it kind of even as a day forward process where if you pick up a piece of paper don't put it back in the file convert it into a digital format um, and make that part of your in information ecosystem. And, and look at machine learning. I mean, one of the things that was uh, in this last poll, 14% said they have it, but they don't use it. Um, you know, the question is why? You know, and, and let's understand how machine learning can help improve that process and then extend those technologies like e-forms and mobile devices and cloud um, to extend your information ecosystem beyond the walls and, and allow that 24-7 access from anywhere. You know, and when I say anywhere, I've experienced this 30,000 feet above the, above the ground, right? Anywhere, anytime. Um, so working above the clouds, in the cloud, so to speak. So these are some of the things I think, you know, um, from my perspective would be some of the key takeaways or things to consider. And so, Teresa, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Um, I know we have a, a few questions coming in here, and uh, we're going to get to them real quickly. I just want to touch on one other thing. So I know, um, in you know, Greg had mentioned you know a lot about machine learning, and mentioned a little bit about um, you know with AI, the artificial intelligence. Just want to let you know that AIM has a new training program out there um, on these emerging technologies, and you know if you. Uh, 
to purchase this um, online education bundle um, online, we're running a special discount right now until the end of this month, until May 31st. Receive a $50 discount. Just use that promo code TECH2018. Um, but this, this training program um, will cover not only the machine learning, AI, but also things um, about uh, exploring use cases in the cloud, a little bit more about robotic process automation and blockchain as well, um, all in, as it relates to information management. So go to aim.org slash emerging dash tech to learn more about this training program. I just wanted to point that out to you. And just want to jump back to the questions we have coming in. And quickly, just want to take um, – Try to squeeze a couple of them in before we run out of time here. And um, this first question here, uh, and Greg, let me d direct it over to you. Uh, you know, how do you, how can we ensure quality with the distributed scanning? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one, especially if, if you want to extend the definition of a distributed scanning to mobile capture. I think really, it, it, um, if, if it's a if it's a distributed scanning piece of it that can uh, marshal images into a queue that has a standardized standardized image pre-processing function, where it does things like uh, performing image optimization to a specific standard, I think that's that's probably the single best approach. So route them through a single process that can ensure that you can automate as much of that image quality as possible, and then what what isn't. Um, can be can be done there. Now, if it's truly distributed, then there need to be some other things implemented in terms of ensuring that the images conform to what's needed, and that's usually done by rules and, and other types of things. And Teresa, can I chime in on this one as well? Oh, certainly. The uh, part of this will be because we were talking about uh, literally deploying the hardware scanners into a, a distributed scanning uh, environment. Uh, one of the things you can do is uh, standardization. Now, uh, this will sound parochial, but it's not intended to be. The, uh, it, it's not so much having the same scanner deployed everywhere because we actually advocate against that. It's about uh, making sure the scanner is the correct one for that workstation. But if you standardized on a brand, you have standard drivers that are built on the same platform and have all the same controls. It allows the uh, whoever is setting it up, whether it's the worker or the IT professionals, to have common settings throughout, and that can uh, make sure that uh, the, uh, the individual images coming in uh, are consistent quality. Good tips there. And just want to squeeze another uh, question in here, and Greg, let me start with you. Others feel free to join in. Um, what would be an important first step to move from someone who has just like basic OCR type scanning operation to a truly automated system. Well, if, if basic OCR, if by basic OCR you're basically just doing page level OCR or full text OCR, I think the the first thing is to uh, look and, and select one of your highest volume document volume processes and understand what type of data you need off of it. Um, it may be just a structured form that you can use to uh, automatically locate and extract that specific information, or, or maybe it's an account stable process. But I would say start, <clears throat> start with one business process, identify the documents within that process, excuse me, <coughs> that constitute the most needed data, and then start there. From then, you can then work into your requirements and everything to evaluate uh, specific technologies. I, I would tend there. to agree with that. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, we are getting to the end of our webinar time. We've actually kind of gone over the end of our webinar time, but thank you for sticking with us. Um, don't forget to download the resources that were uh, listed to the, the, um, to the right of the slide area. Appreciate it if you take a few moments when our webinar is over with to take the survey. Um, very much want to thank the underwriters, Periscript and Epson. Um, as Bob had mentioned previously, without the support from our solution providers, we wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So thank you for your sponsorship. Just as we bring this webinar to a close, I just want to leave everyone with our speaker's closing thoughts. And I'm going to start first with Bob Larravee from AIM, your closing thoughts today. I think the key to all of this is really to kind of get a grip on what you have in your, in your information ecosystem. And as Greg just mentioned, um, take some time and target a, a 
particular process, focus on that, and and really move forward on that to get a handle on it, not just with um, things like analytics, but just in general to understand how things work, where information enters and exits the process, and then how uh, you can make that capture at first touch point and automate the process itself. Thank you. And um, Mark Pickard from Epson, your closing thoughts today. Uh, I was struck by the importance, uh, I have been for a long time, the importance of efficiency in these processes and how to choose the right software that will bring you the efficiency that you need. And of course, we advocate all the right hardware, but uh, it, it all comes down to choosing the most efficient solution without uh, leaving any, any gaps in your consideration. Thank you. And Greg Council of Periscript, your closing thoughts today. Yeah, I'll go to the. I'll, I'll offer, offer a, a pragmatic thought. Is rather than look at at uh, you want to scan documents or, or get rid of paper, uh, look at a business process that's key to your key to your organization, uh, and then look at the documents if, if any that are involved in there, and, and do away with this uh, paper versus those you know scan documents versus the digital. Look at the nature of those documents, and then identify what's the best way to shepherd those things uh, quicker and more reliably through a, through a process. And, and then I think that um, success-based projects will have a, a greater opportunity to uh, to win out. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone for your time today. And for AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you on our next webinar.